Excellent. All right. I hope everybody had a good lunch and uh, we have an amazing panel for you today. So welcome. So this is the panel uh, defining the live sports streaming experience. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? I think that's part of what this whole panel is even going to focus on. Um, it's so diverse, right? You've got, you know, everything from the front end application, the user interface, what we think of as the, you know, the the user experience, maybe how they access, you know, maybe it's some really cool creative presentation of data. Um, but then you've got, you know, the quality, the reliability, the stream, you have the picture quality, you have everything that goes into this. So um, I, I'm just going to warn you, we're not going to touch on all aspects of that. So if you're here hoping we're going to really dig deep into one particular, um, please, we're going to have Q&A. Feel free to ask questions. We encourage that. Uh, also, after the panel, uh, I, I, hopefully the panelists will be able to hang around and, you know, if you want to uh, come up or, you know, we'll step aside because there's another panel coming after us um, and, you know, we can go deeper. So this is going to be a really fun hour and let's jump in. Um, I've asked the panelists to introduce themselves and then we are going to dive into an engaging discussion. So one other housekeeping uh, thing here is because we don't have a mic and the room's big enough makes it a little bit hard to kind of raise your hand in the middle and ask questions um, just logistically. So hold your questions until the end. I promise we're going to carve out some time uh, and then, you know, you can uh, you can get your questions in. We'll do our best anyway. So with that, John, you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. Good to be here today. So I am Jean Macher. I work for Harmonic. Harmonic is a video technology company. Uh, we do streaming technology. That technology runs in the public cloud. We offer it as a SaaS. And uh, we focus on live and VOD streaming. And in the past few years, we've had great success with uh, sports streaming in particular. Um, so we, we focus on the scale aspect and we do big events like the World Cup the Super Bowl, you know, the Olympics. So looking forward to the discussion today. Good afternoon. My name is Serhat. I'm the CTO at Adia. Adia is a publicly listed company uh, at NASDAQ. Even though it's been around for 30, 40 years, uh, we have uh, recently listed on NASDAQ, separated uh, uh, from Xperi. We have two business units. One is semiconductor, the other one is media. Semiconductor is focused on really strategic technology and around packaging, hybrid bonding, three nanometer, even strategic from a national security perspective. On the media side, media is defined, everything, audio, video, whether the video is applicable to cable, over the top, consumer electronics, or social media. Uh, we are a pure R&D house. 70% of the people in my team uh, have PhDs. Uh, we also dabble in heavily into computer vision, natural language processing, uh, AI. And streaming, obviously, is uh, core uh, of our business. My name is uh, David Gonzalez. I'm uh, the OTT Tech Lead for uh, La Liga Tech. Uh, um, La Liga Tech is a joint venture uh, owned by Globant and La Liga. La Liga is the National Soccer League at uh, Spain. Uh, we, as part of La Liga, uh, started developing uh, products for the sports industry uh, years ago, uh, focused mainly in the in La Liga competition. But now, as La Liga Tech, we are offering those products to uh, to other sports companies. Uh, in uh, among other products, we offer uh, anti piracy and also uh, a white label OTT platform. Uh, but we don't only uh, develop the, the, the platform, by, but also we operate the platform. So we have experience uh, broadcasting uh, big uh, and small events uh, uh, for, for La Liga and for other customers. Hello, uh, I'm Stephen Claw Chilisi, and I'm the Director of Streaming and Broadcast Distribution at ESL Faceit Group, which is the world's largest esports company. Uh, we're responsible for some of the world's biggest esports events and distributing them all around the world to millions of viewers. My function there is exactly that, uh, handling all of our encoding, contribution, transport, distribution for 
all of our events all over the world. And I will uh, I will finish off. So my my name is John Alexander. I work for Akamai Technologies. So Akamai is a, a CDN company. We also have large uh, security business and a, a, a newer focus on compute. Um, at Akamai, my role is to to look after that CDN business. So we work with. Uh, Many different uh, rights holders, leagues, uh, content owners on uh, on delivering their content uh, over the internet, and uh, sports streaming is one of the uh, the specialties that we uh, we focus on. So, looking forward to the panel. Awesome, and I always forget to do this. Introduce myself. So, <laughs> so my name is Mark Donigan, and obviously I'm the moderator today. Um, a little plug: if you don't listen to Dan Rayburn's podcast, um, check it out. It's uh, I, I have the opportunity to co-host uh, with him, and uh, every week, you know, we just cover the news that matters. So, um, anyway, a little plug there. Uh, let's start the conversation here. So, you know, we talk about uh, really, you know, innovating around the sports experience, a live, you know, streaming experience for sports specifically, and there's so many aspects of that. So taking a kind of a systems view, why don't we kind of start at that 40,000 foot and then we're going to, you know, over the course of the next hour, um, uh, dig deeper into what the workflow looks like, what the various elements are. But what is the difference between a live sports streaming architecture, what's required to deliver that and an entertainment VOD service or a fast service or any other live streaming workflow, you know? In other words, we hear a lot about sports. What's the difference? That's a great question, Mark. Let me jump in. I'm sure other participants have a lot to say. I actually want to, like, uh, jump in since you focused on the system level. Like, everything we do is media capture, transmission, and rendering, even though that 40,000 level view, it's, it sounds as simple. It's very complex, right? And when we say live, I mean, it's very clear. It's happening right now. I got to watch it. It's very important. I'm passionate about it. I actually want to like split down sports a little bit because David and I were talking about this before we came here. You know, sports is very different things to very different people, right? You go to China, ping pong. They're passionate about that, right? The guy is spinning the ball. You can't even see the ball. He's hiding because that's part of the tactique, right? I've been to earlier sessions today. The focus was NBA, NFL. I'm passionate about soccer. I've watched every single game in every single World Cup since 1982. I can tell you what happened. So, you know, it's not the same thing, right? Sports is certain people are passionate about um, football. Certain people are soccer. Certain people tennis, baseball. You know, certain sports have a particular characteristics around it. I look at soccer, it's like the stock market. Three minutes before the close, it's kind of floating around and then pfft, the bottom pulls out. Things get can get very volatile, right? If you watch this latest World Cup or even like 2008 uh, European Cup, a team is two, nothing down, two minutes to go, and then they come back and win, right? So if you watch the game, 0-0 zero, zero for 85 minutes, and then you went out to get a drink, a goal happened, well, those things happen at a quant level, right? One nothing, as if like you have never watched a game. So when you look at the full picture, I know the audience is very sophisticated and technical. I'll just put on my regular user hat, right? I'm watching the game at home. Well, there are so many different parameters before even focus, we focus on the back end, right? The front end. Am I watching on a phone? Am I watching on a tablet? Am I watching on a TV? Is the TV 40 inch? 70 inch. Am I watching it through a, a streaming stick? Or if I'm watching on a TV, what kind of operating system that TV is running? And uh, who's my ISP? While I'm watching it, what's happening at my home? Is my wife watching Netflix at the same time? Is my kid doing remote education through Zoom or somebody else is having a Zoom meeting? I actually tried this, right? I tried to tell my teenager, Hey, can you do your gaming some other time? I'm watching the game. That didn't go well, right? It's almost like you need a calendar QS level management within your home. 
And no matter what the content publisher or the delivery, till it gets to your home, there's so many things that are happening in your home, right? Through your router, what's the operating system router is running in? Is it running on 11 AC? Is it the mesh architecture, right? There's so many things that needs to be happening all at the same time at the right level so you can enjoy the game in the best way possible. And let's face it, the users want the best quality. I don't want to see any pixelation. I'm a guy who actually tries to look at it very closely, try to see like the macro blocks. I hate buffering, ghosting, freezing, if there are frame misses. So there's a lot of expectations from the user and the media transmission uh, part, uh, the caching part, it's a very complex ecosystem. Uh, and it's all about the live. And you're gonna ask, well, aren't there other services that are live? Yes, there are. I mean, during the pandemic, we have come to expect to be on video conferencing calls for a long time. And those are experiences, they're small, right? They're not 10 million people, it's capped at 50, even though the experience is also live and it's uh, two way. Anyway, I'll, I'll pause here. So so what do, we, what do we do with that? Am I on? Okay. <laughs> what do we do with that though? Because um, all those things are true, but how do you action that? So. You know, the, the, the audience is sitting here saying, okay, I'm operating a service and I realize I have to deal with these myriad, I have to deal with in-home network issues. I have to deal with varying playback devices that have varying capabilities of codecs they support and on and on and on and on. What does this mean at the encoding level? Like how, you know, yeah. Harmonic, um, you obviously supply encoders to a wide range of applications, but primarily, um, uh, you know, broadcast, you know, pay TV, premium, live and VOD. So what does this mean at the encoder? You know, live sports versus yeah, some of these other exactly. services. So I'll try to answer as the VO streaming technology, you know, vendor here. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at VOD, starting with a simple VOD, you know, delivery, um, this is a, a file, video file that has been, you know, transcoded, prepped, QC'd yeah. as many times as needed so that it's good to go. And then you deliver it to one viewer. So yeah. arguably it's, you know, one viewer, something goes wrong, that one viewer is impacted. Yeah. When you do live sports, you have the venue, the source, the contribution link, you go to the streaming platform, and you encode for many viewers, potentially millions of viewers. So what I'm saying is that you transcode in real time, everything happens in real time, and many more things can go wrong yeah. because it's in real time and you have that source aspect that is you know, much more complex than just a VOD file. So uh, the, the, what we call the blast radius, if you have a problem, the impact is much bigger and you need to build enough redundancy and resiliency in your encoding, in your streaming platform to be able to cope with any issue, okay? In a nutshell, that's the big difference between the two. You're asking about the FAST. The FAST is also pre-recorded material, so it's easier. It's not a live source, so you don't have the source component to manage. Uh, you're delivering to many users, so there is that one to many aspect. If, if you have a problem, you can impact a lot of people, but still, by far, the live sports is the most complicated one. Interesting. Other comments, I think, observations. I think that uh, uh, regarding uh, live sports, uh, I think that the biggest challenge is the way that fans consume the content. Mm. Uh, at uh, La Liga Sports TV, what we found is that, uh, especially in big uh, events like the last uh, FIFA World Cup, we we, we saw that uh, most of the fans uh, switched to the channel in the last minute. So you need to to uh, prepare everything. For the worst, uh, for the worst case, uh, you need to make sure that uh, your infrastructure and, and the CDN and and uh, your origin is protected, uh, because uh, yeah, you will uh, you you will receive the storm, mm -hmm. and uh, and you you need to be ready for that. I think that's the, the biggest challenge. And regarding the, the encoding. Um, I think that it's quite important to adjust the encoding, uh, not only depending on the content, but also uh, in the geographic region that you are going to to broadcast uh, your service. Now, uh, for, for instance, uh, we we broadcast uh, different uh, sports, not only soccer, 
And uh, there are some sports that, uh, that uh, there's only one single camera and there's no movement, no movement. Uh, there's no uh, traveling. So you can adjust the bit rate, you can adjust the decodec to optimize uh, uh, and to, to, to try to reduce the, the, reduce the cost as much as possible. Uh, but also, if you are going to, uh, for instance, when we uh, launched La Liga Pass in, uh, at, uh, in Thailand and uh, Indonesia, uh, we uh, came to the conclusion that uh, there, the the the, uh, the average bit rate that uh, the fans uses there were uh, like 15% lower than in Europe. So we focused uh, the the encoding ladder uh, in the in the lower bit rates mm -hmm. to optimize the the experience there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say for, from my perspective on the distribution side, I mean, it's really a a thundering herd problem. It's there, there are several classes of use case that exhibit the same, same behavior. So it's not unique to sports. We, we see similar patterns with uh, sneaker sales, with uh, a, a release of a new uh, season or update for popular on online games. And so mm -hmm. it looks very similar from, from a network side and the, the challenges that it, it exposes, typically around handling scale um, in a very, very short period. Yeah. And Maybe we can explore this later, but typically the problem isn't in video. The vast majority of problems are not around video. Video is relatively well understood at this point. Um, yeah. we, we know how to do that. With the right architecture, the right diversity, the right resiliency, we, we can get video to, to end users. Yeah. yeah, actually, I'm really glad you brought that up, John, because um, <laughs> we are largely past. Someone made the observation in a, in a session this morning that, like, when's the last time you've had buffering? You know, like really, <laughs> it's and and when I do have it, it's like I'm shocked I didn't get it before because I'm like on one bar and I'm trying to watch some, you know. So some of the old issues that we dealt with, things like buffering and you know frames dropping and all this kind of stuff, are, are kind of behind us. Which is to what you just said that, you know, and and, and as Akamai and as CDN, you're delivering a lot of these streams. You guys are doing a pretty good job. So are all the CDNs. You know, it's 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 well known. Um, but where there's still problems, and this was you know to the point uh, about like the World Cup and soccer, and you know, so the game's going and it's kind of boring, and people drop off. Then all of a sudden, you know, Twitter's lighting up or whatever, and everybody's authenticating again on the app, right? Or at the start of the game, or you know, whatever it is. Um, curious, you know, if there's any experiences to share or insights into um, how that how that issue is being addressed. You know, whether it's encryption, whether it's key key transfers, whether it's you know just simply authenticating accounts. But in other words, the non-video stuff, which DRM and security, you know, you can't really say it's non-video. But anyway. Um, any, yeah. any I mean, so something that we, we work on um, with our customers who, who are handling uh, sporting events is is that preparation kind of like the uh, the, the, the pre-game preparation of what are all the services that are in the critical path yeah. need to work for, for a person to get access to to the content that they want to consume and then load testing against those making sure that you you go through the the failure scenarios and maybe you've planned for a million concurrence what happens if you hit 10 million what's your DR strategy and I think probably 90% of the issues that we see will be one of those APIs surrounding the, uh, the, the video experience or a pre-flight check or an authentication mm -hmm. encryption. Something like that is typically where we see, see the issues. And so doing load testing before, um, going through kind of the wargaming of mm -hmm. if this uh, service starts to get overloaded or is slow or returning errors, what do we do? Is there a degraded experience we can fall back to mm -hmm. so people can at least get access to the content? Or what do you want to have happen? So that graceful degradation, something that needs to be thought through. And it's very hard to simulate live, live events. Uh, as we said, they, they happen once, uh, like a World Cup final. You, you don't get a dry run. Um, you, you don't get a lot of practice. Yeah. I heard um, uh, Mayor Srinivasan from uh, Fox Sports in an earlier session comment about around the Super Bowl, how they spent a week just scenario um, planning and just going through all those scenarios, which no doubt 
you know, it's interesting. Someone should have asked him, how many of those weren't video related? <laughs> and my guess is he probably would have answered a fairly high number. So yeah, I have quick anecdotes uh, based on what John mentioned. Uh, you know, he mentioned graceful degradation. I mean, this is still related to um, video, but, you know, uh, maybe buffering problems have gone away, but intermittent quality problems uh, are still there. Sure. Uh, for instance, let's say for a stampeding herd issue, everybody just joined during the last five minutes, trying to see if Mbappe is going to be able to equalize with Argentina in the final game. So and we've seen this at Super Bowl. You see kind of this popcorn problem generally happens when the camera is focused on the audience and it's there are like thousands of people there. What we came up with is a graceful degradation of the resolution because, you know, adaptive bitrate streaming protocols have been there for 10, 15 years. And when you go, when the bandwidth goes down, when you go from 1080p to 480p, it's a bad experience, right? So we can actually take that to 1080 to the 720, more of a laddering process. And the other one is, I don't know how many people use the live text function on your iPhones, right? You can actually leverage a similar computer vision method to make it always, all the text on the video, always visible all the time, even though the video degrades for a few seconds so that you still able to see the stats and all the banners, etc. Anyway, quick anecdotes of what yeah, we've done. That's cool. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, let's um lot of a lot of talk around new, you know, technologies. Uh, you know, new codecs, new distribution formats, you know, WebRTC. Um, what are the experiences of the panel? about, and there's always a balancing, right, of doing something because it's cool and innovative, and there's generally value behind it, so, uh, but also delivering a real better experience to the user, to the customer. Um, I found some of Dan's opening comments, you know, a little sobering. I'm sure a lot of us did, if you, if you heard Dan's opening remarks. It's sobering to think that streaming services and service providers are removing the top bit rate. Like, wait a second, doesn't everybody want 4K? <laughs> it's sobering to hear that only 10%, even 5% of the streams are 4K. It's still 1080p. And, you know, those of us in this room, you know, might say, well, it shouldn't be that way. But the reality is there's business dynamics. There's, you know, there's the reality of the market. What are... You know, I think it'd be really helpful and maybe we'll just kind of go down because I know all of you have, you know, go go down the down the line here. And, um, you know, once we start with you, John, um, you know, what is Harmonic's perspective on this? You know, how do you balance? Yeah, so absolutely. And I completely understand uh, I want the best video quality and a little shock. I think there's hope. That's the good news. That's right. There's, there's hope. hope. There's I hope. agree with you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and. I want us to reflect on maybe something you've experienced without realizing it. Um, how were you watching live sports, you know, previously compared to today? Mm -hmm. So previously, when streaming platforms started, you were still watching a linear channel. And you had games, you know, scheduled, planned on that linear channel with the complication of when exactly is it going to start, when is it going to end, over time, rain delay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And more and more, it's not longer like this. What you have is the game is a single event that just, you know, lives for the duration of the, of the match. And that's it. And of course, the cloud helps. You can spin up resources to run that game and you spin it down at the end of the game. Uh, that helps because now I don't have to worry about sched scheduling it on the, on the linear channel. That's one. It helps also in uh, sports rights management. It's a simple yes or no. I'm a user. Can I access that particular event? Yes or no, as opposed to the linear channel where potentially different programming have different rights and different attributes. So now that I have a single live event, guess what? I can allocate different you know, video quality parameters. I'm not constrained to have the same video quality all the time for my linear channel. And so we see that more and more you can distinguish among your live events, mm -hmm. some of them being more premium, 
And you can say, for this one, I want the, I want the absolute best. I'm going to unleash all the capabilities that the cloud give me. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to be more compute. It's going to be more costly, but just for the duration of that live event. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's one thing that I think, you know, uh, brings me hope that you'll see more and more better video quality, including 4K, because, you know, you're watching a single live event for a limited duration. Okay. And, um, you know, that's, we've been working actively on this and, and we see that more and more, it's no longer a linear channel. It's just a pop-up event. That's great. Um, for the things that you mentioned, Mark, um, two things caught my eye. One was AI based compression and the other one is, uh, uh WebRTC. So I'm pretty bullish on AI based compression. I don't know how many people caught it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Apple acquired a, a small startup that's yes. focusing on that. And, uh, you know, we've been in this uh, hardware-based, macro-block-based compression world for 20 years, maybe longer than that. And it's the most crowded, most worked-on area, right? And uh, every codec is a backward-compatible version of the previous one, and it has to be, because otherwise you can't really inter interoperate with the previous equipment. But when you take a second and think about, well, what's the reason for that acquisition? It's not just because they want to be queued. Because, you know, you have 265, 266, and at some point you're hitting the wall, right? You need to come up with something else that can do better. But you still need to be interoperable. Well, that's not a, as big of a problem for Apple, right? Because they can control both sides, the player and the encoding side. But there is more to it, meaning 20 years ago we didn't have cloud. We didn't have machine learning. We didn't have the neural networks. Now we have all of that. And uh, the early innings, you, you can see it, right? I mean, you can go to Netflix website today, content-based encoding, shot-based encoding. So I'm bullish on that one, and we've been working on it for a while, not for 2D, most, more for the volumetric uh, video. On the WebRTC, uh, you know, that's a protocol that was done for communication, chatting, polling, all of that. Um, and then there are low latency versions for it, um, you know, it helps with the browser interoperability, but you know, um, in terms of scaling, it's not really meant for uh, live streaming. If you apply hybrid architectures, use another caching server, a streaming server, you can get a, a better result. So there's a lot of hope there. What I'm bullish about WebRTC is the other functionalities that it brings. Right today, when you go to a live streaming YouTube channel, there are a bunch of people who are chatting. Right? So I'd like to have that group watch, group chat functionality. And I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, the Fed chairman was having a, um, a conference, right? While that conference was going on, there was a Twitter spaces going on with 10,000 people watching and then talking about it. Sure. These are kind of the newer applications that creates more user engagement that can be enabled with the WebRTC, so very positive on that one. Yeah, and that's a, a just, just to jump on that, you know, in the sporting experience, what we're here to talk about, um, that's pretty cool. Like, Social. could you imagine the fans, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 fans, you know, all getting into a room, but it's real time, and there's even that video interaction possibility, and that's only possible, of course, with WebRTC. I tend to agree with you. I think WebRTC gets... Um, and I want to jump ahead and talk about because I do want to talk about it. And John, you know, I'm sure you have some very good perspectives there. Um, but uh, it, it's sort of uh, being applied maybe in the wrong manner. Everybody's trying to use it for distribution and, you know, and everybody's hitting a wall. Like it doesn't scale and there's quality issues and it doesn't support all the codecs. And, and so there's um, workarounds. But what you just talked about is good. So, okay, David. Uh, we think that uh, things like uh, WebRTC are very uh, interesting in some use cases, uh, but uh, it's okay to disagree, by the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> just because I said what I said. <laughs> yeah, but uh, probably OTT platforms. We as an OTT platform, uh, we tend to be conservative with uh, with this kind of things. We need to make sure that uh, stability is the first priority. Yeah. Uh, we need to offer our fans uh, the best uh, experience possible, and and uh, and uh, they uh, what they claim is that they don't want any buffer or any problem, uh, and they don't care 
about they don't care about the the uh, the latency. Uh, it's not the the main problem. The main don't problem. they don't they care about hearing their neighbor cheering before they've seen it? <laughs> yeah, they, they care. They care about that. That's not the main problem. The main problem. <laughs> That's a joke, by is the, the way. Buffer, is buffering. Buffering. Yeah, uh, we we didn't receive during the last uh, FIFA World Cup. We didn't receive any complaint from our fans about latency. Yeah. We only receive uh, complaints about uh, buffering and yeah. things like that, but <laughs> no one called us and said, hey, uh, what about the latency? Yeah. Yeah. And regarding 4K, the main problem that uh, we find is the cost. Because not, not only uh, the cost uh, about uh, delivery of the content or the encoding, but also the the end-to-end -end solution. You need to produce uh, the content in uh, in 4K, hardware is expensive. Uh, you need to do the contribution uh, with a very high uh, bit rate. If you uh, work uh, in the cloud like 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 us, uh, you don't you can't uh, do a, a satellite download. Uh, you need to receive the uh, the signal uh, through a private probably a private private connection or or, or in the worst case uh, through internet. Yeah. So it's a challenge, especially for uh, for uh, small competitions. Uh, not uh, I'm not talking about uh, La Liga or uh, Super Bowl, things like that. No, uh, but for small competition, it's not affordable. So, so your your answer or what you're saying is that you would be a little bit slower, maybe to adopt a new technology, only because of preserving. The customer experience and controlling costs because these things they're, they're all trade-offs right yeah you know in some cases you can still deliver that customer experience but it's gonna be really expensive you're gonna have to run twice as many machines you know in the cloud for example well who's gonna pay for that <laughs> yes so. there was so much good stuff said there and i'm trying to remember it all every time someone says something yeah, yeah. i've got something that's the problem with being at yeah. the end by the way yeah, it's sure. kind of like what they said <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff there, especially the real time interaction. I think is a good one because uh, that's mandatory in esports. Like you'll yeah. never see an esports broadcast where the entire audience isn't there in the sidebar chatting. Well, that's part of the culture, right? I mean, yeah. that is. E yeah, I mean, it's 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 absolutely mandatory, and and I think leading into some of the other things we talked about it. From the esports perspective, everything is driven by by the end user, by the by the customer, or whatever you want to call them. Like everything has to serve them. Like we're really not interested at all in anything that's just a tech demo, anything that's a, a gimmick, or, or even if something is a legitimately great feature, it's it's all about what they want. Like if, if they're not interested in it, then you won't see it in in our broadcasts. Um, and I and I think a lot of the stuff, especially like 4K, it touches on that, right? Where I think there's no question, you know, that, that it looks better, right? Like, I, I think of my movie collection, right? I have, I have a pretty big movie collection. It started a long time ago, so a lot of it's DVDs. And it's like, why would you watch a DVD when you could watch it in better quality? And it's because ultimately I'm watching the movie for the story. The, the, the quality is secondary or, or in some case doesn't even matter, right? And I, and I think you can have a, a feature which is perceived better, quantifiably, measurably better, but still the audience don't require that, right? I think a, a really high quality 1080p, like a 3G, is sometimes more important than the 12G where they go, yeah, this looks amazing, but if you take it away, it doesn't matter. They're still happy with what they have. So the question is, do you want to invest in that feature? Like I think every single feature we look at, every new technology, everything we're doing, we think about, do they want that? And like, and if we have a, an audience of a million, you know, 10,000 want to watch in 4K, is is that enough? You weigh that against, uh, well, you definitely want, that 10,000 matters. You want to serve content to everybody. Um, but you have to figure out how much you want to invest there, like how important is that feature. Yeah. I think um, latency is another one, I think is a really good one, because that everybody talks about that in streaming, right? It's a, in, you know, a goal is scored, everybody in the arena cheers, one second later, everyone on TV cheers, and then the users watching streaming, they're waiting, they see on social media something exciting has happened, and then they get the goal. I think that's a really interesting one, because it's definitely it's definitely about approach, right? And I, and I think um, 
you hear that a lot in traditional sports. How do we solve this problem? And I think in, in esports, you really don't run into that problem. And, and why is that? I think because we just approach our technical workflow diff differently. Like, a lot of what we've talked about so far is, is distribution. So you already have the content. It's already safe. You've, you know, all that first part, you don't think about that. It's just how do we serve the viewers now? We spend a lot of time thinking about the first part is, you know, in the venue, the encoder, how do we want to get that to the view, uh, to the user? So you start at the end. What do they need? What do they want? Uh, understand what is important to them and then go back through the chain and try to think how to get that to them. You know, we, we don't want to transcode it if we can avoid it. We want to try and encode it one time and get pass through quality. So essentially you want the lowest possible bit rate for that. If, when it comes to latency, we, in traditional sports, you see a lot of TV first. So everything is acquire the content, mm -hmm. TV, it's for TV, they've got it, and then OTT comes afterwards. It's right, okay, how do we transcode it down and package it off and, and send it out? And we don't think about it that way at all. Everything is streaming first and TV second, or, or ideally as close as possible. So I think it's, it's quite interesting whenever I hear that example, it's like, how do you solve the problem of someone cheering watching TV and then the person on the stream being left behind? We don't really have that problem because we would make TV wait. So <laughs> like, that's, uh, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different cases like that in esports where there's very similar to traditional sports in terms of the problems, but sometimes you go a little bit further back in the workflow and you can sometimes make a problem just disappear rather than having to actually solve it. So. So let's talk a little bit because, you know, you're in an interesting position where you're basically you're a contribution. You're operating a contribution service effectively because you're onboarding to Twitch and YouTube and, you know, I don't know, dozens or whatever of, of other <laughs> platforms. Yeah. Anybody who'll take your stream. Right. Yeah. It's free. Um, right. But people don't pay for esports. So it's, it's, yeah. it's all about getting it. Everywhere exactly. Get it. And, and so do you find that you need to look at even your um uh, encoding profiles and recipes and like you say, um, you know, even codecs you use is sort of what's the common denominator that can cut across all of those? Or are you able to say, hey, this platform can accept 4K and they actually, you know, uh, just as an example, this one's, you know, HD, but only this codec and this one is a little better co modern codec, HEVC, whatever. I, I mean, are you able to get granular or do you kind of have to you know, give a plain vanilla. Well, we, we get really uh, granular. I, I think we, we're, we're always trying to think about doing the best for every platform, right? So, so okay. right, you know, what, so we send, what we send to Twitch. You're optimizing as much as you can exactly. for each platform. What we send to Twitch is different to what we send to YouTube. Oh, okay. Because YouTube accepts uh, a lot more, a higher bit rate. They higher have more rate, renditions yeah. available. The difference is you, uh, YouTube is going to transcode everything. Like there, there is no you know, first generation in code, whereas yeah. Twitch will allow that. Twitch, Twitch, they'll do a ladder, but you can also have the pass through, but it's restricted in bitrate. So I, I think everything we do is is focused towards how do how do we optimize it, but we're always pushing lower, right? I think you see some AAA traditional sports, I mean, the Super Bowl is a great example, right? You're going to see an incredible spectacle and everything that they do is going to be at the highest level. Like yeah. maybe 4K is the, the exception, but, but uh, everything you see generally is like that. Um, I think it's easy to do more with more. I think, I think the way we always look at it is how do you do more with less, right? Yeah. And I think... You know, when, when 5G was the, the hot topic like years ago, everybody thought, okay, bit rates don't matter anymore. It's like, we have 5G now, you can do whatever you want, everything that was before, you can throw it out the window. I, I think we don't see that trend actually play out in reality, right? Everything is still about squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Yeah. It's like people say, when when is Twitch going to allow a higher bit rate? The answer is never. Why would they want to do that? Right? It just costs more money. Is you want higher quality with less bit rate. And we approach everything we do in the same way. Uh, optimizing, squeezing downwards in technology, yeah. but trying to up the experience, hold it up, and and the quality, the reliability is the most important, right? Obviously, you, you, reliability. Uh, you touched on this as well. Like, nothing is more important than reliability. You can sacrifice everything else piece by piece by piece. You cannot have the sport interrupted. Yeah, yeah it uh, re reminds me. You know, again this morning, um, uh, Dan asked everybody to raise their hands because uh, he was making the point about how bit rates are being, you know, depressed, and of course. You know, um, Akamai, you can speak to, you know, kind of how over time bit rates have really ultimately come down. Meanwhile, resolutions delivered have largely increased in just the complexity of the video. And so Dan said, how many people in this room feel, 
your Netflix video quality has gone down over the last year or two. And of course, no hands went up uh, and no surprise. And he said, yeah, and they're delivering double digit percentage, fewer bits percentage wise, fewer bits. Like in, in some regions, I think it's almost 50 percent less bits. They've cut the bit rate, but they're using advanced codecs and more advanced encoding schemes. And, you know, and so that's exactly you know, to what illustrating what you're talking about. Yeah, there, I think, I think every is, every workflow right now is going that direction. If it's not pushing going, it bit rates going down, down. Yeah. you don't want to do more with more. You want to yeah. do more with less. Yeah, more That's with the rule. more with more is not a sustainable model. <laughs> so, but I think kind of the interesting kind of point there. I mean, so I think that's good for for the industry because it allows you to do more with less to more people. Yes. So something we should yeah. recognize is. There is so much more demand out there if we compare kind of the, the largest television broadcast to the largest streaming events. Yeah. There's a large uh, cricket event going on in India right now. I, I hope everyone follows cricket. Um, but uh, like that, that's one of the largest events that, that we see on our network. So yeah. 20 to 30 million concurrents for, uh, for, for, for the cricket games there. You look at the largest television audiences they would see for a World Cup final. It's, uh, it's an order of magnitude higher. To, to a globally distributed audience. And so that's where the optimizations that we bring into kind of the streaming workflow just allow us to reach more and more people. And so we're still very much on that growth curve and all of the optimizations that people like Netflix have driven into their pipeline just allow them to reach more people. Yeah, and so absolutely. That's, that's good for us uh, overall. Yep, yep, 100%. So... I think this is a good point to, you know, we're kind of already in this, uh, on this track. So let, let's stay here, but expand it a bit more. You know, I'm curious, what are the roles of technology um, in delivering new experiences? Because uh, we all acknowledge that, uh, you know, consumers are becoming increasingly de demanding. I mean, it wasn't too long ago and just being able to watch video on this was kind of like, oh, that's cool. You know, now it's like they want all kinds of other things. Um, maybe, you know, we don't have to go down the line, but, it, you know, from where you sit with the things that you're personally working on and your companies are your company is doing, you know, where does technology fit? How much of delivering and building a new experience is technology, i.e. we have something that now we can do? You know, in other words, we have an enabling technology and how much is it um, just having the willingness, you know, to 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 build something new and to maybe change the way that we've architected our systems. Uh, well, maybe talk having, about that. having the idea, like the, the innovation. I mean, so technology is definitely an enabler, but it's probably 10 to 20 percent of the overall problem. Like someone has to come up with a unique idea, yeah. uh, a, a non-intuitive, non-obvious uh, idea that doesn't exist already. Yeah. Then there's, hey, does it make commercial sense? Like, shall we actually go invest in doing it? But there are cases where technology is an enabler. So right now, like one I would call out is the ability to, to run personalization on the edge of our network is allowing people to create new experiences where mm -hmm. there, there can be a targeted experience that's unique to, to you as an individual. Um, we are not replicating broadcast anymore where everyone gets exactly the same content at the same time. We can have very targeted, tailored experiences yeah. that are generated in real time. Like that wasn't possible five years ago. Maybe you can explain that a little bit more because I, I I know a bit about what you're talking about. Um, you know what's possible by because we all hear about the edge, right? You know, oh, you can. There's there's real time encoding at the edge, real time packaging. There's all kinds of experiences that can be built. Can a you give some example examples? Would be a virtual channel. Um, so the, the idea that um, based on who you are, your preferences, maybe what packages you've signed up to, what you're entitled to, or kind of interests you, you've expressed, we develop a, a tailored uh, experience for you. And this is maybe getting a little bit away from uh, kind of live sports, but um, based on your interests, we can create an experience that is personalized for you. You, you like BMX and um, sailing and uh, snooker. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've created a tailored experience for you where we mash together the content we think is relevant for you, plus a bunch of other things that we think are adjacent that you might be interested in. And that's totally different from what Claw wants or what the, the audience wants here. And we, we can give 
huge audiences, millions of people, those those one-to-one -one dynamic uh, experience. Well, it certainly applies to advertising, right? You know, in a live event, so. So totally agree that you need the ID first, right? And then the technology to support it. So maybe some examples here um, for sports in particular, we see the newer generation that are less eager to watch a game for the entire duration. And, you know, everyone, leagues, teams, you know, operators are trying to find a way to keep the engagement mm -hmm. for longer times. One way to do that is you've seen it, you know, some gamification. We're not talking about betting yet, but put some, you know, overlay that will ask who's going to score the next basket, who's going to do this or what, right? So it's a great idea because you, you improve the engagement. But now you need the technology so that that data overlay in the app is tightly synchronized with the video. Yeah. So we can do this, but, but this is a good example of, you know, synchronizing your video with the app to improve the engagement. Started with the idea of the engagement and the gamification of the game, of the, of the experience. Um, uh, another one, maybe if we look at um, the advertising, you were just talking about this. So we've been living through a world of the traditional commercial break for <laughs> decades, right? And you start to see new ideas, uh, different type of what we call the inventory. But uh, think of, uh, oh, there is a timeout in the game. There is a free throw, low action. I'm going to, you know, squeeze my video, do a double box and put the ad, you know, in that second box. We start seeing this. And OK, it's a little intrusive, but at least you keep the action going and you don't have a break. Right. And then you have the even, uh, you know, next generation where it's in content placement. So we don't see that for live action yet. But the idea is that, you know, you have in the video some placement opportunity detected where you have, again, something addressable, commercial, you know, placed right there. So it's a new type of inventory, not constrained by the limitation of the commercial break, less intrusive for the viewer. Uh, we are working on that technology. We need the technology to enable it. But those are example ID first and technology after. I think the important part, though, as well, is is what the audience wants, right? Like serving the community Absolutely. with what they need. Because I think we we touched on like the idea and then the technology to support it. And but ultimately, the way we look at it in, in esports for sure, and, and I think probably in, in all sports and all content, it's it's all about will the audience accept that? It, it more than will just will they accept it? Like does it actually add to their experience? And yeah. and I think that you know the the double box and for example that's that's like a, a hot topic in esports is uh, how how do you do that? Is it acceptable? I mean from the viewer's perspective, it seems to be no. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Don't interrupt my sport. But uh, I think it depends, right? It's uh, there's. Esports is a really good example, I think, because uh, what, what you touched on in terms of enabling it, I think technology is is super important because I think esports wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the technological advancement, right? Like when I got into streaming like over a decade ago now, like what we do in esports, it just wasn't possible. Like it just couldn't be done. And now anyone can do it, you know, even on the smallest scale. And, and so I think it's it, it's vitally important to keep progressing, to keep inventing new things and going, okay, there's a cool tool over there. Like, I, I want to use that. If, if it's open sourced and free, amazing. If you can afford to buy it, uh, okay. Uh, but I think ultimately everything has to serve your audience, serve your community. If, it, if it's not for them, there's no point. Yeah. Right? It's, like, it's, it's, it's got to, they're, they're the customers, they're the reason we're doing it. And if, if it's not a feature they want, uh, it's not going to make it. It's not going to add to your experience. Yeah. For sure. Well, I want to open up for questions, and uh, we've got about 12 minutes here remaining. So, any questions for the panel? No, I guess we've done a, either a great job yeah. or. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, let me just rephrase it for the video, the, yeah. the uh, question, uh, repeat the question. So, the, so basically, um, you're in a remote production environment doing live, uh, i.e., you know, you're 4G, 5G connected. How do you deal with that? Because <laughs> that introduces then a whole nother uh, challenge in terms of delivering, you know, a high quality experience to the user. Yeah, in La Liga Sports TV, uh, we work with small uh, sports federations, and uh, they most of the time they, they, they don't have uh, the the uh, the, the uh, budget to to have a big uh, editors and big production teams. So they most of the time they use uh, live view uh, packs, and uh, so what we do is we try to uh, open the connection. Uh, the sooner the better. Um, Half, uh, half an hour or maybe one hour before the event, uh, test the connection uh, as much as possible because uh, obviously uh, problems could happen. No? But if you test before, you make sure that uh, at least uh, one hour before the, the match, everything is uh, working. Well, Murphy's Law is always there, no? But, uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, Mur Murphy can show up. Yeah. Uh, are are you usually on 4G or 5G networks or uh, 4G mostly? And and is this like bonded? So what bit rates are you normally streaming? Uh, well, it depends. Out of the venue, or it depends. Uh, I don't have exactly the the the, the data, but uh, it depends on the yeah. uh, on the location because uh, of the network. Uh, and this is interesting. I would assume that then just by definition that you do have limited cap bandwidth, either because of cost or just availability, 1080p is probably your yeah. top resolution. Yeah, top right? resolution. Yeah. Do you even sometimes have to go to 720p? Yeah, even 720 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some cases, depending, because uh, sometimes uh, Two teams are playing in, in the yeah. middle of nowhere and yeah. uh, there's no uh, bandwidth at all. So yeah, you need yeah. to adapt. Uh, and is it 60 frames or 30 or, or um, the U U European? 50. Well, 25 or 50? 20, 25 <laughs> progressive. 25 progressive. Yeah. 25. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yes. Mm. Okay, so the question is load testing, and how far do you go to you know try and simulate like the real load? Like, what do you do? I try to do load testing uh, with the uh, with the CDN. It's quite difficult. It's in, it's, I think it's impossible. At least you need to uh, contact the CDN. I think that Akamai, you you have a guys uh, some kind of uh, load testing services. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but if you try to to uh, to do a, a load testing with uh, your CDN, you will find that you, you can emulate uh, the, the huge amount of audience. No? What we do is we uh, try to uh, replicate the audience in the origin, not in the CDN. So we try to stress our origin, and we believe that the CDN uh, does the, their job in the other side. No? That we do what we do. Exact same answer. We the demarcation for us is the output of the origin. Then we pass it on to the CDN. Still, that origin needs to be, you know, shielded or protected against uh, surges of sessions or users, you know, joining. Um, yes, you test, you anticipate, but also experience. Uh, you need to have done it before. I know it sounds a little weird, but you need to have done it before. I give you an example. We've done a lot of big events last World Cup. Uh, you know, you have group uh, games. The last group games, two games are in parallel. At the end of the first match, everybody switched because, you know, there were a few minutes still going in the other game, and that has a big impact on who was going to qualify. So you had hundreds of thousands of sessions all at, in, you know, at once added to the origin because it was going through the CDN to the origin. And so we were very close. We were at max capacity, a little too close for comfort. And so we learned from that. And the next time, the next games, we pre, you know, configured more nodes for the origin so that we were able to sustain this type of surge. So experience plays a, a big, you know, role. 
you see that even with with YouTube, for example, right? When when YouTube started live streaming, that was a really common thing. When they did the stratosphere jump, you know, as soon as he jumps out of the balloon, nobody can watch it anymore. And now that never happens on YouTube, right? I think ultimately there's there's nothing you can do but but pick a partner, or if, you know, or if you are the CDN, then you've just got to get that experience, right? I think you you don't know that you can or can't do it until you try to do it. Cool. Good question. Yes. Okay, awesome question. So um, maybe a couple parts to it. He said, how much value um, is there in alternative views? You know, so like the quarterback cam or the, you know, just uh, various of a sporting events um, of a sporting event. And then I will layer on to it for comment. Um, you know, we touched on, uh, you know, like WebRTC and alternate real-time views that could be running down the right-hand side of the screen or whatever that you could click into. You know, is that an application, you know, for some of these other, you know, stadium cameras that are located around that somebody could choose to select or look at? So, anyway. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, there is some value to that. I was involved with uh, projects uh, with... Um, uh, large uh, scale streaming events, right? So um, I'm gonna just gonna tie it back to everything we talked about so far, right? You know, in engineering, there's a trade-off, right? You kind of suffer on this parameter, you get some benefit on the other one. Uh, and unless you over-provision and spend a lot of money, which we are saying we're not able to do. So uh, the reception on that sort of a feature was around 30% to me, that's good enough. Why? Because when we talk about fan experience, just like when I first started, let's talk about live sports. And I said, oh, let's talk about what is what does sport mean, right? Fan experience. Now, it all goes back to know your customer, right? Certain fans are different than other fans, right? My wife cannot differentiate between 720 to 1080p, but I can. Certain fans really want that stuff, especially when they're in the venue, they have a limited vantage point, they cannot see everything else, or they have a particular need to feel the emotion. The, they're so passionate. How is Lionel Messi gonna score that goal? How is he gonna beat that goalkeeper or pass that defender? So in certain cases, they just wanna focus on Lionel Messi. S certain cases, they wanna focus on the audience. Certain cases, they wanna look at the referee. So we, I think, came up with like seven different camera angles. For the people who are interested in that, they wanted more. They wanted to have like a PTZ functionality. I want to so actually can control see, the camera, you can right? control the camera. Yeah. So they actually want to be the director. So I'll make an analogy to gaming. Why? Because when you look at the demographics of sports, like NBA, NFL, we got to admit that the age group for that is pretty high, right? But the new generation that's coming in, they're uh, used to gaming, gamification, to social media. So they're questioning, oh, I can do those things over there. Why can't I do, do it over there? So they want more functionality. So I think we have to think about layering the customer set, who is a fan. In social media, there's a concept called super fan. Who is a super fan? In gaming, uh, the regular, let's say Candy Crush type of games make all the money, but the people who are really into the gaming, they spend a lot of money. If you know how to know your customer and particularly target them for advertising, merchandising, these kind of extra features, there's a lot of room to play. Uh, to me, you start with the experimentation and target that feature for the people who care about that feature. And even a basic initial trial of 30%, to me it's good. Even if it is 10%, and if there is willingness to pay, Definitely, that's a feature uh, worth uh, rolling out. Like in esports, we do a lot of this as well. Like especially if it's you know five on five, the player POVs or something. We've done a lot in the past. Mm -hmm. There's people who want to see the arena when they're not in the arena. There's there's all kinds of stuff going on. I think we. I, I I don't know the exact numbers. I think I think we would say like lower than thirty percent usually is is what we see. 
Um, but I think everything said there is is absolutely true, right? It's 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 all about it's all about your community. How 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 many fans? How many of how what percentage of your audience want that, right? And 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 if you think that you can deliver that with a low enough overhead, with a low enough invest, then you definitely want to do it, right? You're you're not gonna even if it's like the analogy I used before or the example I used before, where it's, you know, a million viewers and only 10K are, are using this, like you, you don't want to just say, oh, well, that's not enough. We're not going to do it. Right? It's, the question is, well, what do, how much do you have to invest? Right. And and 4K, I think, is an example where in a lot of cases, the, the investment doesn't work out where you just go delivering 4K. It often isn't important enough to in, invest in your production line, which is actually the way more expensive part. I think when mm -hmm. if, if you if you want to make 4K content, there's obviously a lot of expenses and difficulty in streaming, but the real cost is in production. But I think with uh, with uh, auxiliary streams and, and different POVs and stuff like that, it really just depends how much is it going to cost you to do it. And, and I think if the if the cost is low enough and you've got a, enough people watching, then why not? It's a better premium experience. If, if you can do it, do it. Yeah, that's that's a question that varies sport to sport, game to game. Like yeah. it goes back to know your customers. In yeah. certain cases, you can rob Peter to pay Paul, somebody who doesn't care about 720. Okay, give them lower quality, and then use that bandwidth to do these other things for the people who are interested and willing to pay. Finding the limit—that's really the important part. Finding finding where you don't want to go below. Yeah. Right? You have to know that, and then everything you do above that is playing around and seeing what works and doesn't. Interesting. That's a key insight. Okay, we are. At time, Dan said we probably have two or three minutes we could go over. So if there's one more question, we'll take it. Otherwise, we'll close. Okay, but, but let me just give someone else a. And any, okay, Alex. All right, go for it. Okay, so the, the question for the video is, um, is there going to be a point where esports will take over traditional sports? And I think you were actually asking if just the experience or the expectation of the demographic, if it's more exciting, right? Is that, or you're surmising or you're trying to get an opinion? Okay. I mean, you, you know the answer, but not soccer. You know the answer. <laughs> so soccer is way up there. And, and okay, yeah. I would say yes. I believe yes in the future. Yeah. You know, it's it's esports is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and what esports is, it really appeals to, to to younger generations. I think it really it really depends on the sport. And it also, de it depends whether you're talking about the in arena experience, like buying tickets to see the spectacle versus watching online. I think esports is going to catch up and overtake traditional sports in terms of viewers uh, very shortly. Uh, like, honestly, that's what I would believe. Uh, in terms of like where esports is still a lot smaller is you know ticket sales going to the venue. I mean like the, like the, the NHL would be a good example, right? Where I think it, there'll be a lot of hockey games where esports tournaments are going to beat uh, those in viewership, but you're never going to sell as many tickets as, as people going to that arena. Like I think in esports, you know, 15, 20,000 people, that's that's still huge. That's a big event. Um I think the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> I think it is going to happen with soccer being the one that's really going to be difficult to catch up with. Um, but I, 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 how long it takes, who knows, right? I think esports is growing really fast, um, but it's got a long way to go before it's before it's a, as big as some of these traditional sports. All right, awesome. Well, with that, let's close. Uh, join me in thanking the panel. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.